Hey, welcome back guys. It is Sunday. It is a few degrees above freezing um, and it's raining. So we're going to do what every sane person out there wants to do on their Sunday in the freezing cold. We're going to go turn some compost. So stick around and uh, let's take advantage of this rain. Okay, so one of the things that you do when you turn compost is you want to ideally wet it as you go. So taking advantage of the rain is really good because now nature is kind of doing it for us and it saves us some hassle. It's a little bit cold out, um, but it's actually really nice to have to, you know, to save some of the work. Um, another thing I did is I, uh, I brought some, the next round of biochar up from the bottom. I couldn't believe it made it up the hill because it's kind of wet and slick and this thing's heavy as heck. Um, but uh, we've got the biochar up there, so now we have two um, loads of biochar going in there, plus another one that was already in. So that's three loads of biochar all going into this same pile. Okay, so we added the biochar in, specifically now, um, because I want to get it in the center of the pile. So the decomposition, the highest microbial activity is in the about the bottom third center of the pile, close to the ground where it's thermally insulated. And the center mass of a cone is a little about a third of the way down the cone. So I want it in the center of the mass of the new compost pile. So we'll continue putting this over. And as you'll see, I'm kind of prioritizing getting the outside edges of the pile into the center because um, the outside edge is fairly uh, inert. There's not a whole lot going on on the outside. Like I said, most of the activity is on the inner, um, th one third of the way up in the center of the pile and down towards the ground, all there. That's why a pile will shrink over time and it doesn't look like anything's happening, but there is actually a lot of de decomposition happening. It's just not, not happening where you see it. It's happening at the ground level. So we're getting the more dead stuff on the outside, putting it into the center, the new center. And now we'll kind of give this a little bit of a mix and we'll fill it and uh, top it up. I think we'll also put in some of this just pure manure in and we'll just make a giant pile. Remember with compost piles, um, size matters. So the bigger the better, the bigger you can get the pile, the larger the active zone inside the pile is, the higher the temperatures can be in that area and uh, that's how you kill off weed seeds, it's how you kill off pathogens. Um, so you really wanna go as big as possible. Minimum size, three feet by three feet by three feet, roughly one meter cubed. Um, and you just wanna get it, other than that, as large as you possibly can get it. So we're gonna use all this and probably make a giant pile. Also, you'll probably notice when I'm picking it up, it may be hard to see in the time lapse, but when I'm picking it up, I wanna kind of fluff it. I want to I want to break up any com compaction that's in there and I'm doing this handed <laughs> um, and I want to get as much oxygen in that pile as possible. So you'll see me kind of lifting it and kind of giving it a bit of a toss to fluff it up and get some oxygen in that pile. Okay, so I wanted to pause here and show you something. Um, sometimes you'll see stuff like this in your leaves. And what this actually is, a lot of people will mistake in this for fungal mycelium. Um, but what this actually is, is actinomycetes, which is a anaerobic bacteria. It's a deco uh, decomposition bacteria, so it's not necessarily terrible, but uh, the process that it uses will create actually methane. So um, when we, create our compost piles, ideally we don't want to have methane being produced and um, it'll happen when you put leaves, especially unshredded leaves. Some of these leaves are unshredded and you can see where I did have unshredded leaves, they clumped, they formed mats and they prevented oxygen from getting in. So we have different decompo uh, decomposers that move in and uh, these ones are anaerobic. And in general, this is why we also turn our piles to avoid stuff like that. 
Um, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, they're a very important part of the nutrient cycling. Um, however, we want to avoid them whenever we can um, because we have enough methane in the atmosphere. So uh, this is why we turn our piles. If you see that, it's not actually fungal mycelium. It's not mushrooms. It's actually anaerobic bacteria. So make sure you're turning your piles as often as possible. These ones here, they're um, I'm heading down to some frozen chunks. So let's quickly start for spinning the camera. So you know, I've got frozen chunks in there. So there's a lot of ice in this still. Um, like I said, it only warmed up temporarily for a short uh, couple days there. Got a lot of the frost out of the ground, but these are pretty much, they were frozen solid. I can work at the top layers. As I get further down, some of the stuff isn't, uh, isn't thought out yet. So we'll turn as much as we can. We'll build this as big as possible. Again, I wanted this to have as much air in it as possible for when those temperatures do warm up um, so that we're getting as much aerobic decomposition happening as possible. So let's explain what just happened. I know I turned compost, but you know, it's, it's always deeper than that. So if you think about what just happened, turning the compost pile, assembling these materials, um, permaculture is all about cheating. So permaculture is about cheating in an organic, natural, sustainable way. But um, what we want to do is capture, let as many organisms as possible do the work for us. Traditional gardening methods are all about, you know, planting, you know, amending your soils, putting minerals and nutrients in, putting fertilizer in, uh, killing everything we don't like with herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, nemicides, and then trying to grow in a sterilized environment as possible, and then the humans doing all the work. So permaculture is the complete opposite of that, because when you think about it and you take a step back, um, are there humans walking around inside forests keeping them going there's not it, it's ridiculous forests in the world would actually revert to extreme fertility if humans left so why do we think that we have to stop everything and have the human do everything this is the major disconnect with traditional gardening and it came out of the world wars where we had all these ammunitions that we had to dismantle we had all this um, nitrite and nitrates that we had to get rid of so we sold them to farmers and then farmers used them. They got great yields right away, but they killed all the ecosystems. And then they're dependent, almost like a drug addict, on having to do the same thing over and over again. Permaculture does the complete opposite thing. We take humans kind of out of the equation and we look for areas where we can get someone else to do the job for us. Because, uh, you know, that's the sweetest way. It's the lazy way and it's the way that works the best. Okay, so think about what went into this compost pile. We've got a ton of leaves. So we put, I think, I wanna say roughly 20 bags of leaves in there. Think about the time that the trees spent growing leaves, collecting solar energy, turning that solar energy into sugars and nutrients and then pushing leaves out. And then we come and we pick them up. So we're using the tree's energy and time to do that. The wood chip, same thing. We've got hundreds of years worth of dead trees in there that would normally, you know, fall into a garden, uh, into a forest, fall over and slowly decompose. We've got that in there mixed in as form of sawdust um, and other plant material that are doing the same thing like grasses mixed in there with the manure. The manure itself represents a tremendous amount of chemical energy of giant beasts that are going around consuming the grasses that are themselves putting energy from the sun into their bodies. The ruminants are coming down, picking them up, chewing them, digesting them, using the chemical energy in their bodies and pooping it out. And then we come and we collect that. We add that into our compost pile. 
we've got the charcoal, which represents thousands of years worth of forest fires that are fertility events that are um, captured. We do our biochar run, we inoculate it in this compost. And then inside the compost pile itself, we've got billions, like literally billions of organisms using their chemical energies to digest and turn this stuff all into nutrient. So we're using every single possible free resource that we can. We didn't go and cut the trees down, um, shred them, put them into the horse manure. Someone else did that work for us. This is their waste stream that we're collecting. We're bringing it into our system. Try to tap into stuff like that. We didn't do any work outside of actually making the biochar, bringing the stuff here and turning it. So as much as this was, you know, a high energy expenditure for me to turn it, um, it's a free gym membership, first off. That's why I like to kind of get out here and do it with a shovel and not uh, rototill it. You can rototill this if you want. Um, that's one way to do it. I don't like to kind of try to disturb and kill worms and stuff like that as much as possible. And I actually kind of enjoy the workout. So I'm getting exercise and doing a functional thing with it. But this compost pile represents literally millennia worth of solar energy you know converted into plants into manure into wood into leaves and then brought here into charcoal and then decomposing so it's a tremendous amount of energy that goes into this so when this then feeds my gardens and my fruit trees and there's all this wonderful charcoal in there as well this will turn into this dark black rich soil that then the trees love so i'm hyper speed accelerating my soil into a late stage old growth forest fungally dominated soil remember my saying as always is don't focus on the plants we're not growing plants don't grow plants grow soil and that's what we're doing today that's what we do every single day we don't focus on what is the blight or pest or disease that's taking out my cucumbers? How do I attack that? How do I solve that? Because we spend all this time, you know, solving these short-term problems instead of spending our time solving the long-term problems where if we get there, all the short-term problems just disappear because we have healthy soils, we have healthy plants. Healthy plants are near immune to disease and pests. A pest cannot actually break through the cellulose walls of a healthy tree or plant. So we want to get our plants there. We get our plants there by getting our soil there. And we get our soil there by spending rainy days in March turning a poop pile full of charcoal uh, and you know all those other things that we collected throughout the year. So really, really work on you can plant trees, you can have a garden, you can do all that stuff. Somewhere in your time, devote it to growing your soil and devote it to a long-term soil approach to growing healthy, robust plants. And along that same line, put into place systems in your builds where you are passively creating fertility. So duckweed is a perfect example. This is a tremendous, wonderful forage for any kind of livestock. Very nutrient dense. It grows very quickly and it sequesters carbon very, very, very quickly as well. And this can be harvested throughout the year and put onto the compost pile. And I have this little pond here where my artesian well overflow is. And it's just passively creating duckweed. It didn't used to have duckweed in it, but I went and collected some duckweed from a nearby pond. I brought it here and now this little pond is passively producing duckweed for me for my compost pile. Additionally, um, down here at the wetland area that I did, um, I was going to do a, you know, a whole river guild and put a water feature in and then I decided to put in the pond. So I'm probably going to stop working on this down here and turn it into something similar. Actually it looks like it's already growing. So another wonderful plant, actually one of the most nutrient dense plants um, on earth is uh, per calorie, ignore this swing that fell over, is watercress. So here we have a ton of watercress just passively growing. And in this wet uh, stream system, we actually harvested for that compost pile watercress out of here. So this is another fantastic way to get something useful growing 
um, in your, you know, design some kind of between the side of your houses where, where water collects because that's where they did the, the grading for the drainage. Put some kind of system in where you can go and collect stuff like um, these greens, these really, really nutrient dense greens, watercress. Down here, this was a hand dug pond I did a couple of years ago. And same thing, I plugged some watercress into the sides. And look at this. This thing is absolutely loaded up and full of watercress. And I'm walking through all this deer, all these deer prints. So cool. Just so much wildlife activity down here using these ponds. And this is just such a tremendous fertility boost. I can walk down here, scoop up a whole bunch of this stuff, and it's just free energy that's then going into my plants. Like I said, it's not just about growing plants. It's so much more about growing your soil and putting, you know, fertility building systems into your land. Not everyone has as much land as, you know, a couple acres, but if you do, definitely don't just plant trees and have raised beds everywhere. Put little micro ponds in. Get some duckweed, some uh, azolla, um, watercress, um, hyacinths if it's in an area you know up north where they freeze and die and they're not invasive um, put something like that in where it'll grow really quickly you can collect it harvest it put it into your compost build great rich compost build that soil and then feed that back into your system trust me that's a much better way to spend your time than worrying about how to stop you know rust on an apple tree or you know how to stop um, powdery mildew on your cabbages or you know your squash who cares they're annuals long-term approach think about your soil for next year forget about the plants this year and if you keep doing that your plants this year will just naturally get better and better as the soil gets better and better and you know that saying the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago the second best time is today the same thing goes with growing your soil the best time to start growing your soil was 30 years ago. The second best time is today. Because think about, what would four years from now you rather that you solved? Would you rather that you solved the powdery mildew issue four years prior and you got a couple extra squash that year? Or would four years from now you prefer that you actually focus on building soil so that that person in the future has amazing soil to grow their plants? Keep that long-term vision, always. All right, there's the final pile. It's about five and a half feet tall, probably eight feet by eight feet. I am tired. Oh, one of the best things after doing that is kombucha. I just started drinking it a couple years ago. And man, I gotta say, iced tea used to be my go-to. Um, kombucha now is the best thing, the most refreshing drink. Uh, sometimes water is really, really good. Sometimes kombucha is just fantastic. So that is, oh man, what is that? Uh, so volume is uh, pi, pi over three r squared h, so. You know, I measured it out, I walked it out, it's actually more like 10 feet uh, wide, 10 by 10 by about five and a half, almost six. So that is uh, ballpark 150 cubic yards or cubic feet, which is uh, roughly, roughly six cubic yards. So that's a six yard pile of uh, tremendous fertility. You can't buy that compost. You can't buy it anywhere. Think about what's in that. There's the leaves, the biochar, the wood chips, the manure, the watercress, duckweed, um, roughly six months of liquid yellow gold out of its owner, 
Um, there's uh, rabbit manure in there. There's worm castings in there. There's last year's compost in there. It's been turned. Um, the biochar has been controlled to be a really nice product. You cannot buy that in the store. And I would charge you a fortune if you wanted to take some of that because I worked so hard on it. So make sure you're checking out my biochar videos, you're checking out my compost videos um, because you cannot make this product, you cannot buy this product anywhere, you have to make it. This is a nice bacterial um, dominated from the manures and the worm casting and the green leafy greens but it's also got a nice fungal component with the sawdust, the wood chips, the leaves and the biochar. So this is a fantastic mix product that's great for both gardens and for fruit trees. Amending it into a garden um, you maybe wouldn't include as much wood chips because you want to keep the bacterial content high. If you're growing lots of leafy greens you want to toss a couple soccer balls in for mulch and then you're good to go. For fruit trees you want to put that as a base layer and then you want to wood chip on top to really crank that um, fungal component up that fungal soil that the wood that the fruit trees love so thanks for watching guys and i will give you updates of that fantastic gorgeous looking pile that is a nice rewarding day i got my workout in i'm gonna have a nice kombucha a warm shower come down have a nice warm tea and then i'm off to hockey I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching, everyone.